Well, brethren, we are in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We've been on what, um, to be honest, I've lost track of time. It does seem like a, a long time. I know it probably hasn't been, but it certainly does seem that way in our study. We're going to go immediately from 1 Thessalonians into 2 Thessalonians, so we'll just be continuing this on through both books. And what a, what a wealth of study, what a wealth of information about how the Lord intended for his uh, teaching to be shared with a new church. Isn't that important to you? Uh, uh, don't you find great comfort in the fact that what was being taught then is being taught now? We're using the same letter that was written to the Thessalonians to teach ourselves. How can we not be kindred with those souls in that day? We are all, we are all a part of a very great family of God. And um, one day we will all be together as it was intended that we should be. Uh, it can't be so now. We're tethered to time. We're tethered to space. Uh, we can only we can only be where we are. And we have so many brothers and sisters in Christ that are in other places here in Queensland and in Australia, in in you know the Indo-Pacific region and in the world. So many, and they're teaching through these same books. And those that aren't twisting those words or just letting the words speak for themselves are being taught and trained in the same method that that early church was taught and trained. And as a pastor, to me, that is a great comfort. It's a great comfort to me because I know as long as I stay true to the teachings of the Bible, as long as I present them as they are presented to us, then I don't go far astray. And we all keep on the same line of things uh, as a church. So we learn so many things. It's not just, not just one or two things. This, this book itself has ranged across many subjects. Now we're in that subject of the return of the Lord and um, what comfort we should gain from it. In fact, the latter part of uh, chapter Four and the first part of chapter 5 is all about that. It's all about comfort. Those words are used over and over again in relation to the Lord's return because his return signals something. It is the ceasing from labor. As long as you're in the body, you must work. You must provide. You must continue on. As long as we're here in the body with this sin nature, we must fight against it. We must continue to overcome it by the Spirit's help. So there's work for us to do as long as we live. But when we die, our labors are ceased. There is a rest coming, brethren. And do you know what that means? You know how I said the return of the Lord and the knowledge that there's a, a, a heaven awaiting us that the presence of the Lord is awaiting us, that, that we have riches beyond the ability to fathom on this earth. You can't imagine it. You can imagine a great storehouse of wealth. I can imagine walking into this door and open, opening it up and seeing gold bars from floor to ceiling. I can imagine that in my mind. What would that be like? What would I do? I would immediately say, I don't think I should be here. How do I back out without touching anything? <laughs> That's what I would say, because something's wrong, right? But imagine what's waiting for us so that streets are paved with gold, so that every need is met, so that the, the, the heat of the sun does not light upon your brow anymore, so that tears sorrows are wiped away and they'll be remembered no more. It's hard for us to fathom these things. It's hard for us to fathom because we're right now in the middle of this great fight and fire. 
But these things can be used by us if we will remember them. If we can just keep them in the front of our mind, they will free us and make us able to be the kind of people in the latter part of chapter 5 that we're going to see probably this evening and, and next uh, Sunday morning, uh, the kind of people that God wants us to be, the kind of uh, characteristics that he looks for in those that remain. So knowing that you've got this great rest coming, brethren, who knows how long it will be, you know, we, we have a, a time here to live on this earth and then that time is up and it doesn't catch God awares and it, it, is not an, it is not an untimely time for us ever. You say, but the children, what about the children that died at, you know, two or three years of age from all of the illnesses and all of the sicknesses? And what about those that have been murdered? You know, that have been taken uh, and and cut out of the human body what about those surely surely that it, it was all untimely no my friends they didn't they didn't do it without God's knowledge God understands and believe me God is about to reckon out on this world and on this earth and on these devious and devilish practices and people all of the evil that they have perpetrated on the world we shouldn't be part of their deeds we should never be part of it because God is holding in abeyance his long sufferingness hoping and and reaching out to the world that they might be saved that they might be delivered that's the only reason God's judgment hasn't rained down from the heavens like it did on the pre-flood world because he is long suffering to usward that is to mankind not willing that any should perish so if it hasn't happened yet peter says consider it to be the long suffering of the lord but it will happen it will happen and Every ounce of blood that was shed will be remembered. It is not lost, although it's hidden in the earth or in the caves of the earth or in the rocks and the dens. It's not lost. If it were done in secret and private, it will all be exposed. It's coming. A great day of reckoning of God is coming. But the people of the world are oblivious. And I don't mean you and I, we're not oblivious to that. If I said to you, you know, well, the Lord's coming back and you won't even know when it happens, you would censure me. You'd say, no, the Bible says that if they tell you he's here or there, don't believe them because when he comes, it's gonna be like lightning shining out of the east unto the west. It's going to be a visible, easily known thing. No one's going to be left in the dark. We're looking forward to it. That's what we're doing here today. We're talking about it. See, you would censure me if I said that, and so you should. And if I said, well, man gets away with their sins, you know, God overlooks all of their sins, and, you know, he's not going to hold it against them because he's a loving God. You would censure me and you would say no god's love requires him to be just love is a facet and character and nature of god and it's perfected in god but so is justice and if a judge on this earth will give life in prison and in some places uh, the sentence of death to people who do harm to others then what will the great judge do who is righteous and holy and just? My goodness, it's coming. But what always surprises me is how blind the world is. Completely blinded. Brethren, they don't know. They don't even understand. They, they are, as the Bible says, willingly ignorant of these things. And by willingly ignorant, we mean that it could be known to them. Just pick up this book. It could be known to them. But they don't pick this book up. 
They're willingly ignorant. Yes, that, um, that knowledge of what we have coming, what's awaiting us, frees us. You know how I told you, you have a lot of time because you're going to live eternally according to the Bible. That, that's Bible. That's not me. That's Jesus telling you that I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. So if that's true, then you have plenty of time, lots of time to give. Don't think you're shorting yourself that, you know, the weekend's not long enough to do this, that, or the other, or, you know, I've only got a certain amount of hours. I think this a lot. I'm going to be honest with you. I think it a lot. Oh, I don't have time to do that. In other words, what I'm saying is I don't want to do it. I just don't. There's no time. I just want to rest. Let me lay down and rest. But you know what? If, if I were thinking rightly, I would be thinking long term. And I would say, my rest is coming. But I don't have my rest yet. And I have time. I have all the time that there ever will be. That's all mine. So if I give some of this up, this little fleeting shadow, you know what that is? It's a, it is a good work if I give it up to the purposes of God. And if you give it up to the purposes of God, it is too. There's no difference between you and me. There is no difference. We are the same. We have all the same faults, failings. We have, all, we have strengths which Christ has given us all the same. We have the promises all the same. So if you suffer from it, you can bet I suffer from it. If you have trouble with it, you can bet I have trouble with it. Let's, let's try to keep that heavenly mind. Let's remember we are not willingly ignorant. We have opened our minds to the truth, the truth of God's word and his truth and our belief in that gospel message of Christ has set us free. We are free. We're not bound in any way, though we were in a prison in solitary confinement with, with our mouths gagged and, and, and uh, taped shut. We are free. No one can take away what we have been given. No man can pluck us out of his hand. Now, in chapter 5 of 1 Thessalonians, we start seeing some of this understanding. And what I want to, to, want to bring out here, I guess, is the character uh, of his coming and, and how, how people are reacting to that. So let, let's look at chapter 5. We're going to read verses 1 through 11, then we'll cover off some of this. It says, But of the times and seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another even as also ye do. You notice the two groups of people that are talked about? There are two distinct groups of people and they exist in our world today. There are those who are awake. They are known as the children of light. That is the light of the gospel, let's say, has shined in their heart. 
They look to the word of God and believe it, study it, put it into practice into their lives. They endeavor to walk according to its precepts. They try to increase their knowledge of it a little bit every day, adding line upon line, building their knowledge of the word of God. And it becomes to them a light to their, to their uh, uh, feet and, and they are not stumbling in their walk because they're following the word of God. This, this Bible is a lamp. It is a great light. And we are living in that light. The more you study the Bible, the more it shines around you, the more you find, right? But there, are, there is another group. And the other group are those who are in darkness. He says in verse, uh, verse one here, but of the times and seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. This is something common to both, by the way. The times and the seasons, common to both groups. Yep, the same troubles that afflict those that are in darkness are the troubles that afflict those that are in the light. And I mean by that, the floods, they were no respecter of persons. The uh, current economic crisis, that affects everyone the same. It, it, it absolutely decimates some families, some people, some, some whole industries are gone because they can't afford to keep going. And the trickle down effect of that, think about it. If, if you didn't have Christ, I, I think you'd be a little bit afraid. You would understand the times and the seasons that we live in. Listen, all those little cafes and shops where people go to have their meals, it, there's a lot of small mom and pop places. Remember all of those? You used to go in and buy your groceries there. You had a, you had a guy who sold like a, a, a bottle of, you had a butcher, you had all of those things. They're little mom and pop shops. Well, they're all gone now. People are trying to bring this back, right? And what happens? Well, we have a, a crisis. We have, you know, a flu that covers the world and shuts everything down. And what happens to these businesses? They can't operate. You can't go months and months without any income or with half income because they'll only let you fill half of your shop. Politicians telling you how many people you can have in your own business that you own, that you paid for, right? Who you can have over to your house that you bought. Now, all of these things have consequences. What happens is those people then lose their jobs. As a consequence, it's harder for them to pay their debts for their house. That affects the economy in a broader way. It, it then trickles down, all the way down. Now the guy who drives the truck, not related in any way really to any of these other people, he's affected now. There are less places to go, less products to deliver. And so he begins to find it hard. He stops buying things. He stops going out for those, those quick meals and things like that. And, and the economy starts to diminish and dwindle. Prices go up on, on petrol. And so what you do get costs you 20, some, some say 22% more that, that groceries are going to go up. This is the time we're living in. And then on top of all of that, we have strifes between countries, right? And the, the decisions of politicians to cut off certain groups from trade and cut off this and cut off that, not only does that harm those companies, but it has a trickle down effect. It, it trickles always, always it trickles down to us. We feel everything that goes on in the world. The world is wicked. It's a wicked place. I'm not meaning to say that, you know, that any one place is more wicked than another. Who am, who am I to judge that? But it, the, in general, the world is a wicked place. And of these times and seasons that we're living in, you don't have any need for me to try to explain them to you. You understand them. They're wicked times. 
For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord cometh as a thief in the night. Paul was saying that to the Thessalonians. It's coming as a thief in the night when it's least expected. By whom? By the householder. By the one who is asleep. He writes later on and he says uh, in, in this uh, passage in chapter 5, he says in verse 7, For they that sleep, sleep in the night. And they that be drunken are drunken in the night. And see, this is the householder who wasn't ready, right? This is the world. They're asleep. They've got no idea what's coming. They've got no idea of the times and seasons. They live just one day after another. They take no thought for the way the world is going. They don't see that we're on the precipice of troublesome times. They don't watch the stock market dropping a thousand points in America in one day. They don't see that sort of thing. To them, yeah, it'll all come right. It'll all work itself out. So what does the Bible say that these people say? It says in verse three, for when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them. Notice the word then, two groups, those walking in the light, those in darkness. It comes upon them. They're not ready for it. We're prepared. They're not ready at all. So it's going to come, the return of the Lord is gonna come like a thief in the night. It's going to, just shock and, and amaze the world. They're, they're not going to believe it. They're not even prepared. What's more, as I said, they're willingly ignorant of these things. They shall say peace and safety, sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child. Let's, let's stop though, first of all, and think about this thief in the night. We're not gonna belabor this point, but it's, it's good that you know Historically speaking, what we're talking about. You know, the Bible talks about thieves breaking through and stealing. And you, of course, in your own home, you would imagine that, you know, they would take a hammer or something and knock the, uh, the door handle off your door. Or maybe get one of those things that the police have and bash the door open and get in there. Or sneakily lift up an open window at the back and slide in. That's common, common thought about thievery, you know, that sort of uh, when you least expect it. In cover of darkness, the thief loves the cover of darkness because he can't be seen. The darker, the better. No moon, perfect. It's a perfect time. But in Bible days, they literally did break through. They, the the uh, houses, especially the roof lines were were made of uh, a mud, like a mud brick. And they would actually grow uh, grass on top of that. They would mow the, their roofs in some places. Believe it or not, they would mow it, actually harvest it and take that grass and use it for purposes, feeding their, their animals and all that sort of thing. But you can also easily dig through that, can't you? Dig through, dig through, get down to the little lattice work of wood break through that. Where do we see that in the Bible as an example being told? Do you remember when that uh, man who was paralyzed was brought in to Jesus? He came through the roof. They lowered him down. They destroyed that guy's roof to get this man down. He wanted, he wanted to be healed so badly and he knew that Jesus could do it. So that's the idea of a thief. He breaks through and he steals while the owner is asleep, not ready, perhaps even drunken, having a, a, big, uh, a big time in the world. That's the idea. A person who's drunken is considered to, uh, to be uh, leaving reality for a time. And that's what drugs do. They just let you leave reality for a while. We can't afford to do that, brethren. We're children of light. We can't afford to do it. We know we have to remain sober. That doesn't necessarily mean, you know, not, not drunken in the sense of alcoholically drunken, although we know the problems there. Uh, anything that's against the law, 
You know, if you go out and drive when you're drunk, you get a ticket, you get a fine. You can go to jail if you're reckless enough. So if it's wrong, why would we be practicing it? That doesn't make, doesn't make sense, does it? But anyway, let's, let's stick with the soberness, the idea of the mind, sober of mind. Keep your wits about you, whatever you do. You gotta keep your wits about you. Keep your eyes open to the things going on in the world. You have no need that anyone talk to you about the times and the seasons because I've just told you that there will be troubles and trials all over the place and the world will be telling their own, go back to sleep, it's fine, it's gonna be okay. We're gonna work this thing out. We're gonna put these pressures, these, these, um, these uh, difficulties on this country and they're gonna kowtow, it's all gonna be good. It's all gonna work out, but then sudden destruction. We're not talking about bombs here. We're not talking about, uh, you know, a, a person wiping out uh, humanity with some uh, airborne or uh, parasite-borne disease. We're not talking about that. We're talking about that judgment that we mentioned in the beginning of this day when the righteous judge comes to judge this earth. And he's coming back to convince or convict the world of all of the unrighteous deeds that they have ungodly committed. Don't believe me? Listen to this. I'm gonna read you two passages of scripture. Very, very important scriptures. Let me read you this one first. Revelation uh, chapter one, verse seven. Listen to this. Behold, you know what he's saying in there? Look, I'm telling you something. That's, that's what John is saying. Behold, he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him. Every eye, listen to this. And they also which pierced him. How about that? Aren't they dead? How will they see him? Hmm. And all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Even so, let it be so. Come quickly, Lord. Now, listen just across the page, just back in Jude. Listen to what Enoch prophesied, the seventh soul in descendancy from Adam. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of them saying, behold, Lord, behold, the Lord cometh with 10 thousands. That's plural, 10 thousands. That means an un innumerable host. When you, when you can number something, you say there were a million eight hundred thousand. But in biblical terms, in the language, when you couldn't put a number on it, when it was innumerable, like the sand of the sea, how, how many grains of sand? There are 10,000s, plural. We don't know how many 10,000s there are. And that's what the, the term is used here. Behold, the Lord cometh with 10,000s of his saints. Listen, what for? To execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all of their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and of their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you that there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the spirit, but ye beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. You see, he's coming to convince and to convict the world of all of their ungodly deeds. He's gonna regurgitate them all just like a judge would and read out the list of the things that you are convicted of. Mr. Jones, 
before this court, we find you guilty of, and the list is read out. No wonder the world and, and the people who are in darkness are trying to find more darkness, aren't they? they they're looking for the rocks and the dens and the caves to hide themselves and praying that the rocks will fall on them and hide them from the face of him from whom they have to do. But he's coming to judge. He's coming to uh, bring judgment and justice upon this earth. We're looking forward to that day. He talks about it too as, um, as a woman with child. We know that the birth pangs and we've talked about that before. They shall not escape, and a woman who is with child can't escape, can she? There's no way around it. In modern day, you know, they can take a, a child cesarean. I don't consider that getting away without the pain, right? Because there's a lot, either way you go, there's a lot of pain. You can't escape. The pregnant mother cannot escape the pain that's coming. It's inevitable and neither will they be able to escape. Things will be in motion that cannot be reversed. They are in darkness, the Bible says. They are willingly ignorant of the truth which was proclaimed to them. They are in that state of being lost and severed from Christ, but it's for these at least for those who are willing to hear, it is for them that time, that time is in abeyance at the moment. It's for that reason it has not already happened. That he is long suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. And I suppose of all of the sufferings and the eternal uh, destruction that will come upon all of those who remain in darkness and who are faced then with meeting the ultimate doom that shall befall them, the greatest of the thoughts that, that echo in their mind will be this, that he was not willing that even I would perish. But when that time has elapsed, time will be no more. And we have plenty of time because we're in Christ. But they have very limited time to make a decision. We have a responsibility with the gospel. We share it. We get it out as much as we can. We live it in our life. We manifest the, the works of the Lord Jesus Christ in our life. We mirror his life with our life by going about and doing good. That's what the Bible says. And then when people ask us, we direct them to Christ. We always give honor and glory to the Lord, always bringing it back to the gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation. Now, in our passage here, I'll just close with this. He says in verse eight, let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. Obviously, it's, it's like a battle. It, it's like a war. And we have the implements to defend ourselves and the implements to keep ourselves from being mortally wounded, spiritually mortally wounded. We will not, we will not be facing that because of the helmet of the hope of salvation that we have and the breastplate of righteousness, of faith and love rather. He says, for God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. We're appointed unto that end. That is, you, there is an appointed end. There is a, a, a point of conclusion. And that con point of conclusion is the ultimate redemption of the child of God. And I mean more than just being free from this body at death and our spirit going to be with the Lord. I mean more than that. I mean, I mean more than living godly in this world. 
I mean the entire process being completed. When, when the final round of things is done, when the new body, the glorified body is received, when he has done away with this present heaven and earth and has created a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness, that is the culmination of the whole promise. And then we inherit all that has been promised and eternity is ours with our Savior. That is to what we're appointed. That is the ultimate end. Who died for us, he said, verse 10, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Are you living with Jesus today? Yes, we certainly are. If you're a Christian today, you're walking. Jesus is with you. His spirit is abiding in your heart. He gives them of his spirit that as an earnest, the down payment to what he's going to do, that the whole appointing that we talked about. That's a promise. We're living and walking with him right now. We, our lives are hidden with Christ in God. So yes, we are living and walking with him now. But if we die, are we alone? No. Whether, he said, whether we live or die, we are living with the Lord. We are with him. That's what he says. That whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. How about that? So it doesn't change. The moment before I die, I'll be living with him here. When I pass from this earth, I will be living with him there. I go from being where I am to where he is, but I'm still with him. Nothing has changed. Life continues on and always will. Wherefore, verse 11, comfort yourselves together and edify one another. How can a man go into battle? I'm, I'm talking about war. How can he run into battle, guns blazing, mortar rounds exploding? How can he run into the battle? Oh, he's obviously thinking that this is not going to be the end. No one runs into battle thinking, I'm gonna die. I'm giving my life right here and right now. Everyone thinks they're gonna make it. How could you go on otherwise? And you see some who break down and not able to go to war or do things like that because the fear, it just grips them and, the, and they're just a heap of jelly on the floor because they can't overcome that thought. But I'm talking about those that are bold. They run in. They always think they're going to make it. But we have a confidence by this verse that we just read that we will always make it whether we live or die. So how does this free us, brethren? How free are we? How, how, how much can we give? Well, we can give it all because there's always more. How rich are we in this life? Are, are we rich enough to give to help, you know, people who have lost everything? Sure we are. We've got no lack. We will have never a lack of what it is that we need as long as we live. God will look after us. And whether we live or die, the truth is the same. We will always live and walk with him, whether we sleep or are awake. Brethren, promises are given to free you, not to bind you and hold you down. Promises that God has given are there to make us more productive in this world. In, in, in all the trials, in, in the times and the seasons that we're living in right now. That's, that's what they're there for. And that's why he's saying, comfort one another with these words as you do. What great comfort. I, I'll tell you what, the people of God ought to be the most wide-ranging group of people willing to do anything for anyone 
give of themselves, of their time, of their, of their money, what little they have, little or much. It, it doesn't matter, as the song goes, if God is in it. But, but give of themselves and of their time to pray and to care and to meet together and to encourage and to enjoin one another to work together to help. That's our job. That, that's what we're here to do. We do more when we give of ourselves freely like this than you can imagine because the world is selfish. The world is gathering everything together for this life and for right now. And you and I, we just want what's necessary, just what's needful. And we know God will think about us and care for us. Birds of the air, he cares for those, but we're much more precious to him than that. And let us be the vanguard of the people doing good. Let, let's, let's be different people, changed people. And let's always keep in the forefront the reason for the hope that's in us and the reason for the abilities that we have, that we have eternal life because of what he's done on the cross.